Welcome back, everyone. Dr. Jenkins here. We are doing the end of the urinary system, and then we're going to slide right into a discussion of fluid balance. So we ended in the first video. We went through all the basic anatomy of the kidneys, and then we talked about the basic steps of urine formation. All right. So we talked about the other function of the kidneys. We know the kidneys function to filter the blood and then produce urine. But of course, the other function of the kidneys was all about homeostasis. And I mentioned this before and how important it is. So let's just talk about it a little bit. So let's first talk about how the kidneys help to maintain water balance and salt balance. Now these go hand in hand because in the body, oh, got it other way around here. In the body, water follows salt. So when we talk about water balance, we're inevitably talking about salt balance and vice versa. So you know what? It's pretty simple here. How can the kidneys help to regulate water balance? By reabsorbing more or less water. We talked about the last step of urine production in the kidneys, which was water conservation that happens in the collecting ducts. So the kidneys can <clears throat> alter. Sometimes they'll reabsorb more water. Sometimes they'll reabsorb less water. And that's how we can help maintain water balance. And then because salt and water flow together, we can also help to regulate salt balance. So here are some examples. And of course, probably the easiest example is if you're dehydrated. If you are dehydrated, that means you don't have enough fluid. So your kidneys will reabsorb more salt and water. Simple as that. And you know this. If you're dehydrated, do you pee as much? No, because your body is purposely, your kidneys are purposely reabsorbing water to keep more water into the body to fix the situation of dehydration. And then the opposite would be true also. If you're overhydrated, the kidneys would reabsorb less and therefore you would pee more. Where in this first instance, you would pee out less. Of course, the intricacies of how that hap happens is, are more complex, but this is really the basics of it. And just like the kidneys can help to maintain water and salt balance, they can also, the kidneys, can help to maintain acid and base balance, which is a way of regulating pH. We know the blood pH, the normal blood pH range is so narrow. The normal blood pH, somewhere between 7.35 and 7.45. So we have to stay within this range. It's a very, very narrow range. The kidneys can help. And the kidneys can help by reabsorbing more or less hydrogen ions. Just like the kidneys can reabsorb more or less water, the kidneys can reabsorb more or less hydrogen ions. So remember, when there are too many hydrogen ions, that means something is acidic. And when there's not as much hydrogen, it's alkaline. So those go hand in hand. When you have a lot of hydrogen, it's acidic. And acidic is represented on the lower end of the pH scale. When we have less hydrogen, that's represented as alkaline or basic. And it represented on the higher end of the pH scale. So understanding the relationship between pH and hydrogen. If our blood is too acidic, that's the more common example, if the blood is too acidic, the kidneys will reabsorb less hydrogen. By reabsorbing less hydrogen into the body, it means that more hydrogens are peed out. If my initial problem is something's too acidic, and if it's too acidic, let me go back to the green, and if something's too acidic, it has too, many, too much hydrogen. So if my initial problem is too acidic, I've got too much hydrogen, 
then I want to pee out more hydrogen. And then the opposite is true. If the blood was too alkaline, we would reabsorb more hydrogen to increase the hydrogen in our blood to make it more acidic and bring it back to normal. Again, it's more complicated on a molecular level, but simply put, um, this is how it works. I've given you some examples of kidney disorders, but you do not need to know these. Uh, there's going to be a picture of a kidney stone on the next slide. Kidney stone is when you have um, hardening over calcification within the kidneys. Um, look at this kidney stone. Ooh, so here it is on the x-ray. Do you see that little shadow? You can imagine how painful that would be if it's going to come down the ureter to the bladder. Ooh, because the ureter is very narrow. Okay, I would like you to know the basics here of the composition of urine. And it's true, just like our pets, we can tell a lot about our health by the urine. So make sure you know the basics. What I wanna point out here is the composition. The urine should be 95% water. So it's mostly water and then only 5% waste products. It should be kind of pale to light yellow. Uh, one of the textbooks I have describes the odor as, quote, distinctive but not repellent. I just think that's kind of funny. So the, um, make sure you know the chemical composition. And then also, even if you just said, like, the normal pH range is like 4 to 8, what I'm pointing out here is the pH range of urine can be very wide. This is different from the blood, remember? The blood pH, boy, that has to stay between 7.35 and 7.45. But the urine can have a much wider acceptable range of pH because it's going out of the body. If we were holding on to it, a pH of 4.5, 5, 6, 6.5, those low pHs would be very dangerous if we were holding on to it. But we're getting rid of it. So that's why it's absolutely okay for it to be a little acidic because we're on our way to getting rid of it. So as I said, the normal composition, mostly water, and then 5% solutes. Um, here are some of the things that we can find that make up that 5% of the solutes. The biggest proportion of that, I think over 50% of the solutes is urea. You don't have to know that, but it's just there if you're interested. Urea is a product of protein breakdown. And we do tend to break down a lot of protein, muscle tissue or other proteins. Um, so we're going to have this breakdown product. Our normal volume is about one to two liters per day. You should know that. Poly means you're urinating too much. Oligourea, not, not urinating enough. And urea, um, not really urinating at all. Just have an idea of the normal urine volume. One to two liters. Here are some examples of what abnormal things could be in glucose and what they would mean. You do not have to know these. I think you have enough to know. Um, but we expect a little bit of glucose in the urine, but not too much. We expect no blood protein, but if it, there's any, that's a problem. We don't really expect to see many ketones, but if we do, that's a problem. And we shouldn't see any red blood cells in our urine, but if we do, that's a problem. All right, I want to spend our time talking more about fluid balance. Now, as I said before, this is going to be a logic, logical next chapter. Because the kidneys filter so much blood, because the kidneys play a role in homeostasis of our blood volume, of pH, it makes sense that when we talk about overall fluid balance in the body, we do it right after the kidneys. So, we're focusing mostly on fluid balance. So we're going to talk about water balance, how we balance it, where it, where it exists. We're going to mention electrolytes. And then we're going to talk a little bit more about the acid-base balance. Um, you, you know this. Extreme dehydration or even extreme overhydration could kill someone. So our ability to maintain fluid balance is vital. Um, 
this video was old, probably before your time. I want to say it was 1982, maybe. Um, Julie Moss basically crawled across the finish line of the Iron Man, but it was a really clear visual representation of what can happen when our fluid balance and our electrolyte balance is completely off. It's actually quite hard to watch. All right, so let's talk about fluid distribution. In order to understand how we need to balance fluid and water, we've got to talk about where it is. So we know our body is largely water. I'm not going to ask you that number, but we know our body is largely water. Somewhere around two-thirds of our wa body is water. We tend to store that fluid, which is mostly water, we tend to store that fluid in two places. Either it is stored inside of the cells in what's called intracellular fluid, or it's stored outside of the cells in what is called extracellular fluid. You should know these two. You should know that about two-thirds of our fluid is inside the cells, which might surprise you. So our cells are really robust. They're full of water. And the remaining one-third or so of our fluid is outside of the cells, extracellular. You don't need to know the specific breakdown of the extracellular fluid, whether it's between cells or in the blood plasma. But I would like you to know that intracellularly, here's where we have higher amounts of potassium versus outside of the cell in the extracellular fluid compartment. This is where we store more of our sodium. These are the electrolytes that we're going to talk about in a little bit. More potassium inside of the cells, more sodium outside of the cells. Now, we probably already understand this. Water is constantly moving. So if we have some cells here, we're going to have water moving from the inside of the cell out. Then over here, we're going to have some water moving in. And then we're going to have some potassium and sodium, right? We tend to have more sodium outside of the cells, so they're more likely to diffuse into the cells. We have more potassium inside of the cell, so the potassium is more likely to diffuse out. But there's constant movement. And that's what this picture down below is trying to show you. Water electrolytes is con are constantly moving between the intracellular and extracellular fluid compartments. OK. So we're first going to be talking about water balance. And I'm going to move ahead to this picture because it's a simplistic picture, but I rather like it. So check out this picture. This is what our water balance should look like. These should be equal. On the left, these are ways in which we bring in water to our body. And on the right are ways in which we release water. When we are in fluid balance, they are equal. However much water we bring in, we take out. Let's break down these pictures and talk about ways in which we bring in water. Most of our water comes in through food and drink. This gives you an idea about the average amount for an adult male per day that we bring in, but you don't have to know that. But I would like you to know that most of our water we bring in through drink, not surprisingly, and our second most is food. There's water in food. Some foods are, um, have a higher water content than others, but there's some water in there. And then the last category, which you don't have to know, is metabolic water. So it's there, but you don't have to know it. We produce water as a byproduct of chemical reactions. So when our mitochondria, that's what this is supposed to be, when our mitochondria produce ATP, they are releasing water as a byproduct of those chemical reactions. So we do produce some water just because it's a byproduct of chemical reactions. You don't need to know the specific amounts either. 
Um, just know that drink is how we bring in most of our water. Food is second most. How do we get rid of water? The most common way that we get rid of almost all of our water is through urine. I had said one to two liters per day. That would be between 1,000 and 2,000 milliliters. We also can get rid of water through other ways. You don't have to know the rest, but it's interesting to point out. There is some water in our poop. When we exhale air, there's some water droplets in that. There's cutaneous transpiration, or in other words, we do release some water from the surface of our skin, even if we're not sweating. And then, of course, if we're sweating, that's another way we can release water. And these will change depending on the day, depending on your activity level, depending on the temperature outside. So ideally, we want to keep these balanced. And of course, if we bring in more than we expel, we could be overhydrated. If we expel more than we bring in, we could be dehydrated. We expect minor differences from day to day, but I'm talking about the dehydration and overhydration would be likely to occur over the course of time and in more severe imbalances. Regulation of water. So how do we regulate water movement into and out of the cells? How do we regulate the kidneys? How do the kidneys know when to hold on to more water or when to release more water through urine? Well, first of all, the hypothalamus is the place in the brain that's overseeing uh, our water and fluid balance. This is the thirst center. Um, this plays a role in our body's thermoregulation. So when we, for example, sweat when it's hot out, that's involving water balance. So you should know that the hypothalamus is the part of our brain that will be overseeing our maintenance of water fluid balance. And mostly, hypothalamus is carrying out this regulation through hormones. So we're going to talk about two really important hormones, aldosterone and antidiuretic hormone, or ADH. Keeping it simple here, ADH, antidiuretic hormone. This is our water retaining hormone. When this hormone is released, it tells our kidneys to reabsorb more water or hold on to more water. Maybe I should say that. Reabsorb, hold on to more water. So if we're holding on to more water, we're retaining it, we are peeing out less. So this will help to increase fluid volume. So when we are dehydrated, we will see a release of antidiuretic hormone. Because when we're dehydrated, we need to retain more water to rehydrate us. Aldosterone is our salt retaining hormone. Aldosterone tells the kidneys to hold on to more salt. This means that we retain more salt, and because water follows salt, remember, water follows salt. Because water follows salt, we will pee less and we'll increase our fluid volume. Many times these work in tandem. We'll see a release of aldosterone and ADH. Sometimes they'll be different depending on the situation. And because, these, because both of these increase fluid volume, you might get the impression that there's going to be two other hormones that decrease fluid volume. It's not necessarily the case. We tend to see either more release of ADH and aldosterone or less release of ADH and aldosterone. So if we need to get rid of more water, if we're overhydrated, or if we have a greater fluid volume, or if we have swelling from something, if we need to get rid of more water, then we'll just release less of these two. And by releasing less ADH and aldosterone, it has the effect of the body getting rid of more water through urine. And these hormones are acting on the kidneys in the tubules. Specifically, the loop of Henle is a common one. All right, so 
When we have, when we're dehydrated, we have a condition of, let me go back to white here. When we're dehydrated, we have a condition of low water. So we'll see a release of aldosterone. Aldosterone will, it's the salt retaining hormone, increase our salt reabsorption. And because water follows salt, we'll increase fluid retention. When we have a situation of low water, we will also release ADH. How it works here, we're getting a little bit more specific. Don't worry about that. Okay, now we're going to talk about electrolytes. So water balance is one thing. We make sure we have balance how much, how much water we bring in with how much water we get rid of. Hypothalamus oversees it through the actions of hormones that act on the kidneys. Let's talk about electrolytes. Well, first of all, what, what the heck are they? Electrolytes are charged particles that carry a current. The two examples that we're going to focus on are potassium and sodium. Charged particles that carry a current. Now, we have other charged particles in our body. For example, iron. That's a charged particle. But iron doesn't have this added ability to carry a current. So iron is a charged particle, but it doesn't carry a current. Therefore, it is not an electrolyte. But sodium and potassium, they're charged particles, yes, and they also have this extra ability to carry a current. These electrolytes are so important because they play a role in fluid distribution. And we already talked about why, because we said water follows salt. If we move salt, water's going to follow. And that just gives us an extra boost. We can move more water more quickly. That's a really good thing because of how often and how much we need to move water around. Many times, these electrolytes, in addition to helping with the movement of water, fluid distribution, they're also really important because, let's take potassium and sodium. Nerve impulses require them, and muscle contractions require them. So not only do they help with fluid balance, but every time we have a muscle contraction or nerve impulse, these electrolytes are active. It's pretty darn important. We already said that sodium is found in higher amounts in the extracellular fluid. Potassium is found in higher amounts in the intracellular fluid. And even though they're, going, they're on opposite sides of the cell, they both work together to help with fluid balance and to make sure that we're able to do nerve impulses and muscle contractions. All right. Just like water, it's important that we can maintain these electrolyte balance, and we also do it through hormones. The same too, aldosterone and antidiuretic hormone. trying to think for a second how much I want to talk about this, but I think it's important, especially um, for this course. Okay, so we already know that aldosterone is our salt-retaining hormone. So salt-retaining hormone, aldosterone is released when we have low sodium. So released when there's low sodium, which makes sense. So the problem is how can I write this? Released when sodium levels are too low. So when we have a situation where our sodium, our blood sodium levels are too low, we release aldosterone. And what does aldosterone do? Causes sodium retention in kidneys. to bring sodium levels back up to normal. There we go. So sometimes I find this can be confusing for students, so that's why I'm just trying to write it out. This is how I would study it if I were you. It would work for me. 
Um, so aldosterone is released when sodium levels are low. Released when sodium levels are low. What does it do? It causes sodium reabsorption, retention in the kidneys. So if we hold on to more sodium, it's going to bring that sodium level back up to normal. Our initial problem was not enough sodium. We reabsorbed more sodium to hold on to it, and now we've increased the sodium back to normal. Pretty simple. ADH is a little bit harder to understand, but it's not that harder to understand. So ADH, we already know it's our water retaining hormone, but ADH is released when sodium is too high. So this is different from aldosterone. So whereas aldosterone is released when sodium levels are too low, ADH is released when sodium levels are too high. How does it work? Well, ADH goes to the kidneys, causes kidneys to retain more water because it's the water retaining hormone. By doing so, the increase in water dilutes the sodium concentration. Right? So ADH is released when sodium levels are too high. ADH goes to the kidneys, tells them, tells them to hold on to more water. By having more water, more water, more water in body will dilute sodium levels. In essence, we are diluting the sodium to lower the relative sodium concentration. Lowers relative sodium concentration. So really, we haven't changed the sodium levels. We've just added more water. Use the example of Kool-Aid. If Kool-Aid gets to be too sweet, this is the analogy that would work for ADH. Just like we have too much sodium in the body, what if I have a Kool-Aid where there's too much sugar? Well, one way I can lower the sugar level, one way your body can lower the sodium concentration is by just pouring in more water. So if I have really sweet Kool-Aid, I add a bunch more water and it dilutes it so it tastes less sweet. And it's happening here. We can retain more water to dilute the sodium, making the sodium concentration lower in the blood. And that's what this chart is saying. So we want to focus on ADH. Let's see. I'm going to circle what I'd like you to know. We just talked about at the beginning, aldosterone is released when sodium is too low. Released when sodium is too low. It will increase sodium reabsorption to increase the amount of sodium back in the body. On the other hand, ADH is released when there's too little sodium. And what it does is it tells the kidneys to conserve more water, which increases the volume of water and dilutes or lowers the relative sodium concentration. These hormones are wonderful things. Now, we can have these electrolytes being disturbed, right? And in extreme, we would expect minor disturbances, but in extreme, and you've probably seen this, they can be very detrimental to the health and even fatal. So hyponatremia is a condition when blood sodium is too low. Hyponatremia. I'm not going to ask you the exact milliequivalents per liter or millimoles per liter, but when we have too low of blood sodium, it's a problem. It could happen from prolonged fluid loss and not bringing enough fluid in to replace, or this could happen from drinking too much water, which would, drinking too much water only, which would have the effect of diluting the sodium so much. This could lead to all sorts of central nervous system dysfunction, because remember, what are the functions of potassium and sodium? Fluid balance needed for muscle contraction. Potassium and sodium are also needed for nerve impulses. So if I don't have enough sodium, I can't generate enough nerve impulses, and we can actually have moderate to severe 
central nervous system uh, symptoms and problems. The other disturbance I'd like you to know is hyperkalemia. This is when blood potassium is too high. This could result in some nervous system problems, but the most common um, problem with hyperkalemia is cardiac problems. Potassium is involved with the cardiac muscle contraction. When we have too much of it, it leads to an arrhythmia, a disturbance in the usual electrical conduction of the heart. Okay, last topic, acid-base balance. Here we go. Remember, imprinted on your brain, the normal blood pH, 7.35, 7.45. It is narrow. Even if we have minor changes in pH slightly outside this range, it can still lead to some big problems. All right, let's talk about what an acid and a base are. An acid is any substance that releases hydrogen when put into a solution versus a base, which is a substance that picks up hydrogen when put into a solution. Don't get too caught up in this. Um, if, if you're interested in understanding this better, I usually give the example of just a glass of water. Water. And what if, what if inside it I put a lemon, right? Here's my lemon wedge. Well, a lemon is acidic. Isn't lemon juice acidic? So if the lemon juice... If we put lemon juice into water, so I've literally put lemon juice, the droplets are coming out. If I put lemon juice into water, what's happening on a molecular level is that, let me I'll turn it black here. What's happening on a molecular level is that the lemon juice is releasing hydrogen into the solution. And we know that when we have a lot of hydrogen ions in a solution, the solution is acidic. And the solution is acidic precisely because that acid is releasing hydrogen into the solution, making more hydrogen in the solution. On the other hand, a base, if I have another glass of water, and let's say I put in there baking soda. The baking soda is actually picking up hydrogen. Hydrogen is being picked up by the baking soda, leaving less hydrogen in the solution. And if we have less hydrogen in the solution, the resulting solution is alkaline or basic. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, you can see here a definition between strong and weak acids and bases. You don't have to know those. Um, when we talk about chemical buffer systems, these become important, particularly the weak acids and bases that do not dissociate completely. But we don't have to worry about it for now. The important question here is, how do we maintain that blood pH? It's so narrow, 7.35 to 7.45. Well, we already know one reason why. We talked about the urinary system. How, I mean. The urinary system is able to kidneys. They can retain more or less hydrogen ions to alter the pH. Well, we can also rely on the respiratory system, and we can also rely on something called chemical buffer systems. Here's what you need to know. The respiratory and urinary systems, those are long-term maintenance of pH. In the short term, we utilize something called a chemical buffer. We're always going to be utilizing both. It's just that in the short term, we only have the ability to do a quick Band-Aid on it, and that's the chemical buffers. But inevitably, we have to also utilize these physiological buffer systems to make a more permanent, long-lasting change. So a chemical buffer system is just a group of chemicals. It's a group of chemicals that circulate in the bloodstream. And there's different chemical buffers. There's the carbonic acid bicarbonate, there's the phosphate. But it's a group of chemicals that circulate in the bloodstream. Each of these groups of chemicals contains an acid, a base, and hydrogen ions. 
And most simply put, this group of chemicals is able to release into the blood whichever is needed to bring the blood pH back to normal. So if the blood pH drops, then this chemical buffer, this group of chemicals, will release a base. If blood pH is too low, it's becoming acidic. Well, to temporarily balance that, I release some base. Versus if blood pH is too high, that means it's too alkaline or basic. In the short term, I just release more acid to balance it out. These are effective, but they're only short-term solutions. Right? It is not permanent. We have to utilize a physiological buffer. We did talk about the urinary by peeing out more or less hydrogen ions. And this is the most powerful way to really manage pH. We can also rely on our respiratory system. And really, we can regulate, we can, excuse me, we can alter pH by breathing out more or less carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide has a relationship. So when we have too much carbon dioxide, it makes the blood acidic. So if something's too acidic, I simply breathe out more. And by breathing out more, I'm releasing more CO2, which is acidic, thereby having the effect of increasing the pH. So our example here is if pH drops, it's too acidic, I just breathe out faster. Respiratory rate will go up. And simply by getting rid of more carbon dioxide, I've gotten rid of more acid, and it makes the pH of the body higher, back to normal. Comparatively, if we compare the chemical buffers to the physiological buffers, these ones that are physiological are more powerful. But if I compare just the respiratory to the urinary, the urinary is more powerful. Really cool. So make sure you know what it's called when our blood pH falls below normal. That is called acidosis. You can see a chain of events if you want to understand what happens, but um, if we have too much acid, then there's more hydrogen, and that hydrogen is going to diffuse into the cells. To maintain homeostasis, potassium ions will move out to try and balance that. But when we move potassium out, it makes it more difficult to make a nerve impulse. That's all extra, don't worry about it. Just know acidosis is a condition when blood pH drops below normal. I would like you to know the two main causes of acidosis. And this is pretty interesting that it can be whittled down to this. Really, the only way that we're going to have an acidosis situation in our body is either a cause that's respiratory or a cause that's metabolic. The blood becomes too acidic because we have a buildup of CO2, which is a respiratory cause, or the blood becomes too acidic because we have an accumulation of some sort of acid or some sort of acidic byproduct. And when someone is acidotic, this is what you would want to look at. Well, I can give a short-term buffer, but how am I going to fix the acidosis long-term? I got to think about which causing it. Is it a respiratory cause, COPD, or is it a, a metabolic cause, lactic acid accumulation or ketone accumulation? And once you know what the cause is, you can more easily address that cause. And then on the other hand, we have alkalosis, when the blood pH is above normal. Don't worry about the sequelae of events. It's a funny word. All right, folks, we're done. A lot to cover as always, but if you have any questions, reach out to me.